Judd, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to chat with you again. Thanks for having me. It hasn't been that long, but you have a new book out on anxiety and um, just, I really enjoyed the book. I'm excited to chat about the subject. Great. So I'm just curious off the bat here, what made you write on anxiety? There's so many different mental health issues out there that are affecting people. I mean, it's now known that depression is, is I think, the most known, causing the most disability in today's world. Mm -hmm. And you've chosen anxiety. So I'm just curious, what, what made you go this, this direction? Oh, you know, personal suffering. Uh, I had, you know, I had a series of panic attacks in residency uh, and may have had one recently when I was out in a somewhat uh, dangerous surf when I was surfing. Uh, but also, you know, really struggling with helping my patients with anxiety. When I first started working as a psychiatrist, you know, the thing we're taught in medical school is medications. And there's this term, just to give you a sense for how well these medications work, it's called number needed to treat, meaning how many people you, needed to you need to treat before one person shows a significant benefit. And the number needed to treat for gold standard medications for anxiety is 5.15, which means you have to treat just over five people before one person benefits. So a 20% hit rate for my patients, you know, let's just say it wasn't that satisfying. And if you look at psychotherapy, like cognitive behavioral therapy, a recent review paper showed that about 50% of people respond. So this isn't even a significant reduction. This is just a response to treatment. So I, I was really just struggling with how best to help my patients. Uh, and, you know, my lab had been studying habits, you know, a lot. And I had this light bulb moment one time when somebody asked me if I could develop a program for anxiety, you know, because we developed a program for, you know, an app for smoking, one for eating, you know, overeating and whatnot. And, you know, I was thinking, well, I treat my patients clinically with medications, but is there something else? So I started looking into the literature and it turns out that there's this, this research literature from the 1980s that had been largely overlooked, you know, when everybody was hailing the advent of Prozac there was a guy, Thomas Borkovic, that was studying anxiety and worry as a negatively reinforced process, meaning that it could potentially be perpetuated as a habit. So I was thinking, wow, could I approach anxiety in the same way as I'm working to help people overcome other habits? And so we developed an app uh, called Unwinding Anxiety, just like the name of the book. And we started studying this to see how well it worked. And long story short, we can get into the details if it's helpful. We did a couple of clinical studies, one with anxious physicians. We got a 57% reduction in clinically validated anxiety scores. We did a randomized control trial with people with generalized anxiety disorder, and we got a 67% reduction in these symptoms. And just to bring it back to that number needed to treat, we could calculate that number and it was 1.6. So after all of that, you know, it just seemed like, you know, how can I get this information out there into the world? And I had amassed a lot of uh, studies, well, these studies, but also just some great stories from my own clinic where my patients had really been able to overcome their anxiety and other habits simply through what turns out to be a, a simple three-step process. And so I, I wrote the book about that. Let's talk about the early days when you decide to tackle this. Where did you begin? <laughs> well, you know, the, the very early days before I even thought about studying or, or developing a treatment for this or even, you know, writing a book, it was, um, you know, anxiety and panic in, in residency. And I was fortunate enough to have been practicing mindfulness practice for uh, since the beginning of medical school. So this is about 10 years of practice under my belt. And I remember waking up from a the dead sleep, you know, with a panic attack. And I, you know, I'd wake up and then I would have the panic attack. And then my mind would go through and check off all the checklist criteria and like, yep, you just had a panic attack. Yet I could also bring in a perspective through my own mindfulness practice to see these were just physical sensations. These were just thoughts, even though they were very unpleasant. Like I really thought, felt like I was getting tunnel vision, like I was going to die. I couldn't breathe, like all the classic symptoms. Yet when they, I could just observe them and see that they would fade away. And then maybe 
helped through sleep deprivation, I could go back to sleep. <laughs> you know? And so there was this seed planted in there saying, oh, maybe I could use mindfulness training as a way you know, to help. And that's why I ultimately started studying with my lab with habits and then ultimately uh, brought in for anxiety treatment as well. You talk about in the book this three-gear approach to anxiety, and this is just a beautiful metaphor, and actually it works for you because you've been somebody that's really been into cycling over the years. I think it's BMX and also mountain biking and, and road cycling as well. So how did you begin to you know make that analogy and that comparison and to start coming up with that framework? You know, this actually came from me leading live groups. So at the, I was at the Center for Mindfulness at UMass for a couple of years, and I would run live weekly groups where people would, uh, this was mostly with folks with uh, struggling with overeating or stress eating or whatever. Folks that were using our Eat Right Now app could come in for a weekly a group, uh, I loosely call it session, but basically a group format where we could go over you know, what they were struggling with to help them, you know, basically do this flipped classroom model where they are kind of doing their homework in class and we can make sure they're doing well. And over a couple of years, I started to notice a progression through helping them with their own habits with eating. And it started with them being able to recognize these loops. And, and then you know, there was this progression that they would go through. And I was thinking, wow, this is pretty pretty i'm seeing this a lot so we actually as a scientist i said well let's do a study <laughs> you know so i had a graduate student ariel Bec uh, beckia who did uh, some focus groups uh, and focus group work with them to where we could really articulate you know what they were finding and this ultimately ended up being what i'm calling third gear but i was really just seeing this this pattern and they just identified the pattern and then wrote the pattern down and of course you know made a program based on that three-step process to see if it actually worked. And from there, you know, it just seems like a really good scaffolding for people to really be able to kind of understand how their habits are formed and how to work with them. So before we get into that framework, I want to talk about anxiety as a whole, because this is a word that kind of has some gray area in the definition. And you mentioned there that you've even had a panic attack, it sounds like relatively recently. So how does somebody know when they've crossed that threshold between, you know, a one time off event versus something more clinical when they might need to seek help? Yeah, I think that's a really good thing to differentiate. And so just maybe we can even start with some simple definitions. So anxiety, you know, de the definition is something like a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. And here I want to highlight worry itself can be a feeling, kind of like a noun, and it can also be a verb, I'm worrying about something. And those two actually can feed on each other, which we can get into uh, in detail in a minute, if helpful. But the other piece here, when you think of, of panic, I think the definition of panic um, is something like, you know, sudden uncontrollable fear or anxiety, which I love this part, often causing un wildly unthinking behavior. I think that's the actual definition, at least according to my computer. <laughs> So you can think of panic being this extreme version of anxiety. So anxiety makes our thinking and planning brain go offline. And panic is where it's like we have no brain. <laughs> we're just going to, you know, this is where mob mentality and all these other things come in, where we're just doing wildly unthinking behavior, you know, because our, our thinking brain is completely offline. So think of panic as a, as a further continuum uh, along the spectrum of anxiety. And you said we could further differentiate there uh, within the realm of, of worry. So let's let's break that down even further. Yeah, I think it's helpful to do this, especially because that is that differentiation is what Berkovec highlighted as a driver for anxiety as a habit. So you can think of any habit being formed through a three step or three elements that are critical for it, a trigger, a behavior, and a result or a reward. And this was set up evolutionarily speaking to help us survive, right? So we see food, we eat the food, and our stomach sends this dopamine signal to our brain that says, remember what you ate and where you found it. So it's really there to help us lay down memory so we can remember where food is and go there again. And we can also remember where danger is so we can not go there again and both help us survive for obvious reasons. 
here with anxiety and panic and worry in particular, you can think of that feeling of fear or anxiety, that noun part leading to a mental behavior of worry. And I think this is important to emphasize because a lot of people don't think of mental behaviors as behaviors. You know, we think like I drink or I smoke or I whatever, there's, there's my behavior. But in fact, mental behaviors are just as valid and can drive other behaviors just as much as any other behavior. So I think that's important to highlight. So anxiety is a trigger. Worry is the behavior. And then what this research suggested was that the result or the reward is one of two things. One is that people can distract themselves from the worst feeling, feeling of fear or anxiety, or they can feel like they're in control, even though ironically, worrying doesn't help us control situations and makes things worse because we're not thinking clearly. But it gives us this feeling or this illusion of control because, you know, even if I can't control the situation, at least I'm doing something by worrying. You know, think of a parent of a teenager and their teenager goes out to party with their friends. The parent, you know, is worrying all night until they hear that doorknob, you know, open and the kid's home safe. Well, I'm going to guess, this is a wild guess, that the parents worrying did not help their kids stay safe. You know, <laughs> so, so this is where we can think, oh, I'm worrying, at least I'm doing something when we really have no control over a situation and it's just making us more anxious. So this, this trigger behavior and reward, this is actually the first gear. And this is what you're recommending people take an assessment within their lives of these different triggers and how that is all panning out. So talk about on our first step here, moving into how people would work with this. How, how does somebody go about getting into that? Yeah, maybe I can even start with an example to highlight how this works and then folks can and then I'll give a very clear, you know, way for folks to do this themselves. That'd be great. So I I I wrote uh this about one of my patients in the book because he was a really remarkable case. So this gentleman was referred to me for anxiety. I didn't know anything beyond that, you know, chief complaint. And when he came into my office, I could see that he was anxious. <laughs> Check. So that was pretty straightforward. But when we started talking and I asked him what caused his anxiety, what it was about, the first thing he described to me was where he would start to have panic attacks on the highway. And he described it as his trigger was that he would have these thoughts. I think he said, I feel like I'm in a speeding bullet. And he would start worrying. There's the behavior that he would get into a car accident. And so that worrying led him to uh, start avoiding driving on the highway altogether. And even driving the local roads to get to my office was anxiety provoking for him. So the first thing we did was I pulled out a piece of paper and a pen and just on, the, on my desk had him pull up his chair and I said, okay, let's map this out together. Let me see if this is the case for you. So your trigger is these thoughts, your behavior is the avoidance or the, you know, the worry. And then the, the, the result is that when you avoid driving, you, you, you don't have those thoughts. And he got this look in his eye as though you know, he was in a dark room and suddenly somebody turned the lights on. He hadn't known how his mind worked. He just knew that he had panic. But he just seeing this helped him see how his mind worked and therefore just already helped him kind of see that this wasn't some completely random thing. Now, I went on, he went on to be diagnosed with full on panic disorder because he was panicking that he might panic, you know, or being anxious that he might be anxious. And he also had full blown generalized anxiety disorder. So that was the first step was just helping him map that out. And anybody can do that and pull out a piece of paper, trigger behavior reward or result, and just start mapping out their habit loops. And people can have a number of these. Somebody like this example we're giving here, that's, you know, maybe his primary complaint, but people need to really dive in and, and do a full assessment and see how many of these are impacting their behavior. Absolutely. And on that note, this gentleman I failed to mention was also 180 pounds overweight. Okay. He had obstructive sleep apnea. He had high blood pressure. He had a fatty liver because of his obesity. And when I sent him home, I said, start mapping out your habit loops. You know, I gave him our unwinding anxiety app and said, just start mapping these out. He came back two weeks later for his follow-up visit. And the first thing he said to me was, hey, doc, I lost 14 pounds. 
<laughs> and I looked at him because we hadn't even talked about weight loss yet. But he, I said, what? <laughs> and he said, I started mapping out my habit loops around anxiety. And I realized that anxiety triggers me to stress eat and that that stress eating wasn't actually fixing my anxiety. It was just making me feel guilty for eating because I know I need to lose weight for my health. So here he had illuminated a habit that was driven by anxiety that wasn't just worrying. And this actually taught this uh, kind of hints at step two or the second gear, which is he was starting to see how the, how would I put it? The eating wasn't actually helping him. And so he was starting to become disenchanted with that. So we could, we can dive into that, that second gear now, if you'd like. Sure. But before we do, I just kind of want to touch on one thing that popped up into my head. And you do talk about this in the book. What if somebody does this assessment and they find that maybe their anxiety is leading to a benefit, or at least what they're seeing as a benefit in their life? Maybe it's helping them, you know, grind it out at work, or we could probably give other examples as well. But that's one that pops into my head. And they're like, yeah, I can see how these other things are a problem. You know, I can't drive on the highway. My, you know, I'm eating and this is not in a healthy way and I'm putting on extra weight. But what about the fact that my anxiety is also keeping me driven and focused and, and productive at work? I don't want to touch that part. Is that okay? We just kind of leave that alone. What, what would you say to somebody saying that to you? <laughs> There, I'm glad you bring that forward because I hear this a lot, especially with folks who are particularly identified with anxiety. It's almost like they've taken it on as a as a personality or an identity, knowingly or generally unknowingly, because who, who wants to take that one on as an identity? So here, you, you can think of it as performance anxiety, or if I'm not anxious, I'm not going to meet this deadline or you know whatever flavor of that. I think that's what you're talking about. This this has a fascinating history, and I had to look this up as I was writing the book, where there's a – this goes all the way back to – I think it's 1908 when two researchers, uh, their names were Yerkes and Dodson, and we know their names because this became so famous just in the last couple of years. So they were studying Japanese dancing mice, okay? And they had decided to shock these mice to variable degrees. It's kind of like, uh, you know, a little bit of shock, uh, so mild, moderate, and severe shock. And they wanted to see how much this shock would affect their performance on some task, like running through a maze or something. And what they found was this kind of Goldilocks phenomenon where, you know, mild shock wasn't enough to get them off their butts to run through the maze. Moderate shock, you know, got them going. And severe shock was slightly less helpful at their performance than the moderate shock. So here, you know, Goldilocks rules the day where they can say, oh, mild arousal, you know, a certain level of arousal helps these mice perform. Now, this paper went largely unnoticed for a long time. It was cited, I think, fewer than 10 times in the next, or even fewer than that in the, in the next 50 years. But then this famous psychologist, Hans Selye gave a talk and without evidence supporting this, he suggested that maybe anxiety could be the same type of arousal and en you know, enhancement, enhancing, let me just say that again, that arousal or that anxiety could be that arousal performance enhancing hormone or drug in our body, in our natural drug. So he said this, one of his former graduate students went on two years later to do another study with rats where he held their heads underwater <laughs> and, and as I guess his measure of anxiety. And he found that if he held their heads underwater too long, shock of all shocks, uh, they didn't perform as well. You know, I don't know if it was them just trying to catch their breath <laughs> or what, but this guy wrote in his paper that he used the words arousal and anxiety interchangeably, and then called it this yerkes dodson law, that this was a law that, you know, a little bit of, you need a little bit of anxiety to perform well and a lot, not so much. So this yerkes dodson paper was cited fewer than 10 times until the year 2000. It was cited about a hundred times between 2000 and 2010. 
And since then, it's been cited over a thousand times. So there's this, been this exponential curve in people citing this original research, thinking, you know, that, oh, it's about anxiety that improves performance. But when you look back at the literature, only 4% of papers suggest that this inverted U-shaped curve, you know, that sweet spot for anxiety is helpful. And over 10 times that many papers suggested that it is not true. It, there's a negative relationship. The more anxious you are, the worse you perform. There was a great review article written about this in the last couple of years. I forget the name of the author, but it was something like, you know, from law to folklore, <laughs> you know, how the Yerkes Dodson law just really blew up, probably helpful, helped by the internet. And a heuristic that makes sense to people where they can just say, oh, yeah, well, it's OK. I need a little bit of anxiety as compared to having to face their anxiety. And what I would say is, you know, if we could clone ourselves and do the parallel experiment, you know, try doing a task when you're anxious versus try doing a task when your brain is fully functioning. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Which one's going to help you more? And so if people say, well, I needed to get me off my off the couch to do a project or get my task done, what I would say is there are better ways to motivate ourselves than freaking out, and including I, I write a lot about this in my book about curiosity, like finding these intrinsically motivating attitudes that we all have that don't cause long term health problems like anxiety does and can actually potentially, God forbid, help us live happier, healthier lives. I'll just pull a specific example here. When I think about, say, going up and and giving a speech, and the little bit of anxiety, I'm sure most people would experience in that in that uh, situation, unless they're doing it, you know, on a daily basis or something like that. And maybe it's just an association instead of causation. If we looked at, you know, the anxiety, at least to a small degree, that the average person is going to experience in that case, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's helping. But that might just be on par for the course when you're, you know, going up in front of a group as as a person that doesn't do that regularly. Yes. I think you're highlighting something that my PhD mentor used to say to me all the time. He said, Judd, you have to make sure that you're proving causation rather than correlation. You know, correlation means he, he described it as true, true, and unrelated, where you could be anxious, you could give a good speech, but it doesn't mean that the anxiety caused you to give a good speech. You really have to prove that the anxiety, you have to have anxiety to give a good speech. And there are plenty of people that give great speeches when they're not anxious. You know, a lot of people take beta blockers to help them not be anxious <laughs> so that they perform better in speeches when they're not used to doing that regularly. So I, I would guess this is the case of true, true and unrelated that is correlation, as you're pointing out, rather than causation. And in today's world, we're in, you know, unique circumstances right now being in the pandemic. But let's talk about before the pandemic. Earlier, I mentioned that depression, I think it's the greatest cause of disability right now. How does the anxiety rank? Like how many people are being affected by it pre pandemic? And then is there any stats like early research now showing with the pandemic how that's impacted anxiety levels? You ready for this? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so pre pandemic, pre pandemic, I think of this as BC before coronavirus, you know, way back in the days before there was this pandemic, which is even hard to kind of remember. It's amazing. Uh, anxiety disorders were the most prevalent type of psychiatric disorders out there. So, where depression can cause a lot of disability, like you're talking about. Anxiety, these this class of disorders is the highest in terms of the pre prevalence. If I remember correctly, I think it's one in three people roughly will have some type of anxiety disorder in their lifetime. So it's it's vastly prevalent. Okay, so this was BC. There have been some studies already published in the last uh, six months or so, and maybe some early studies even when the pandemic was just getting started showing that between 2019 and 2020 in the United States, anxiety tripled, tripled. And uh, there was a, a recent study, if I remember correctly, of people that were diagnosed with COVID, regardless of how well or poorly they did, one in five of them would be diagnosed, newly diagnosed with a mental health disorder. And the most prevalent one there, again, was anxiety. So I think we're seeing a large increase in, you know, mental health issues 
with the pandemic and anxiety in particular. And it, it actually makes a lot of sense because our brains really don't like uncertainty. And there's a whole lot of uncertainty happening, you know, started at the beginning of the pandemic. It has continued. We've had a, you know, wave after wave of uncertainty, whether it's economic or schools or variants. All of these things are just examples of yet another wave of uncertainty, you know, hitting all of us as a, as a planet. Well, it's interesting as you talk about the uncertainty and it's, it's obvious that we're all going through a lot given the pandemic. But for me, the question that pops in my head as you talk about that is, isn't that a normal response to uncertainty? Like people that are going through times right now where they're financially stressed and maybe their, their job's on the line. And like those would be times in my mind that anxiety would be normal. So how do we differentiate, you know, having a rational response to a given situation versus it being more of a, a clinical thing? This is a great question. A rational response. Okay. So let's think of the, in, I think of Mr. Spock as the hyper rational being, you know, from Star Trek, where he would always, what was his line? Highly illogical captain, you know, and Captain Kirk was kind of the epitome of emotions. You know, he was, he was crazy, passionate, let's say he was, you know, he's always passionate about stuff and, and they would balance each other out. So you can think of our brain having Mr. Spock and Captain Kirk as these elements where we've got this thinking and planning part of the brain. And when there is uncertainty, what our brain does is it says, hey, this is uncertain. You need to go and get some information so that you can make this more certain. Regardless of what the outcome is going to be, you just need to know how it's going to go. And then that makes our, you know, we get that information and it helps us survive. Okay. So a rational perspective is that we'll just go get that information and we'll do what we need to do. Notice how you don't need to be anxious for any of that to happen. Yet our Mr. you know Mr. Spock parts of our brains aren't actually nearly as strong as the Captain Kirk parts of our brain. Mr. Spock Mr. Spock is the old, the youngest part of our brain from an evolutionary perspective. This is the prefrontal cortex. So it goes offline when we are really stressed out and when we're anxious. So that I think what you're saying in terms of, isn't it normal for us to get anxious? Yes. <laughs> this is what our brains do is when we couple fear with uncertainty, we get anxiety. And maybe an analogy here would be helpful. So think of um, you know, our evolutionary ancestors being in the cave. That was a safe place. And we think of it as in modern day, we talk about the comfort zone. We're in our comfort zone. And when we're in our comfort zone, it's, it's because we can generally predict what's going to happen. You know, if I'm in my house, I can generally predict that there aren't going to be any strangers there, that, you know, it, the, the heat's generally going to work, you know, things like that. And so I go, I go home and it's like my, my comfort zone, literally. Our, our ancient ancestors, it was the cave, you know, where they knew they didn't have to have their high alert signals on that there would be saber-toothed tiger because saber-toothed tigers didn't live in their cave. When they went out to forage for food, they had to turn up their alert signals, their arousal, basically, to be on the lookout for saber-toothed tigers or jackals or whatever it was that ate our ancient ancestors so that they could map out that territory. What they were moving into was, you can think of it in modern day as our growth zone, where uncertainty is saying, hey, go get information. This is what Mr. Spock would do. He'd say, let's go map the territory and see what's going on. Whereas Captain Kirk might go out there and be like, whoa, this is uncomfortable. This is unusual. I don't know what's going on. Let's go back to the ship. You know, I'm not saying Captain Kirk would do that, but you know what I mean? <laughs> so here we can move from our comfort zone into either our growth zone is the way it's described in modern day, where uncertainty invites us to the challenge to say, okay, let's figure this out. Let's map this out. Let's see if there's really danger here. Let's learn. Let's lean into this rather than running back to the cave. But what a lot of us do is we go out and it's so uncomfortable that it becomes our panic zone. And we freak out. And we say, this is just too uncomfortable. I'm running back to the cave. And I think this has actually been perpetuated in modern day where we have so many ways of soothing ourselves that we're not used to being in discomfort. So anything that feels uncomfortable 
is going to throw us into the panic zone as compared to, you know, having learned good distress tolerance, you know? And so you can think of, we have these phones, these weapons of mass distraction, as Cornell West put it, where whenever we're bored or we're stressed or we're anxious, we can go on our phones and, you know, scroll away and kind of distract ourselves for a while. And so that has become our mechanism where we say anything that's uncomfortable, I can soothe myself quickly. You know, in colleges where they have, sorry to go on and on, but I'll stop. <laughs> colleges have these, what do they call them? Safe spaces when, you know, students said something that another, you know, that a student didn't agree with. They could go to these place, these rooms that they would set up that literally had things like milk and cookies, which makes me a little concerned about college. I thought college was about learning to, you know, be in, in your growth zone where you're learning and you're you're meeting people with diverse perspectives. You're having interactions with them, and they're all constructive. So everybody grows from it. But there's a you know there's this movement toward oh let's just keep everything in the in the comfort zone. And I I think that's problematic for our survival. And I think we might be seeing that manifesting now, where nobody can deal with discomfort. Nobody can deal with uncertainty. You know it's like the only certain thing in life is uncertainty. <laughs> So this is a great time to lean into that challenge, that discomfort, and even learn to be comfortable with discomfort so that we can really always be moving into our growth zone. We can quickly see, is this really dangerous or not? Okay, if it's not dangerous, what can I learn from this? So there's a long answer to your short question. <laughs> so when you're working with patients, is it an important part early on in the process to figure out what these distractions are because everybody's going to have different ones, whether it be you mentioned the phone, video games, uh, overworking. I mean, we could probably go on and on and name quite a few here. How important is that for people to assess and find out what those are in their own life and then to have healthy boundaries set for each of them? I think it's critical. So just like this first gear suggests, if we if we don't know how our minds work, we can't work with them. You know, if we can't map these out, we're not going to know that we're doing these behaviors as compensatory mechanisms that might not actually be that compensatory. So just like my patient who mapped out that he was stress eating, he didn't know this that before. And that helped him be able to step out of it instead of continuing that process. So I think it's critical that folks map out their habit loops, whatever they are, throughout the day, because they're often different at different times or in different situations. And that just kind of illuminates the mind a bit so they can just be aware of when they're happening. That's really the first step for change. Got it. So that comes back to gear one. Let's let's pivot into gear two. When somebody has done that work, they've mapped things out and they're kind of aware of what's going on in the world relative to anxiety, where do they go from there? So from there, I'll just touch on a tiny bit of neuroscience because it's helpful for us to understand this process. So think of forming habits as a helpful thing. You know, if we had to relearn everything from walking to putting on our clothes to making food to talking, you know, every day, we wouldn't survive. We'd be exhausted by breakfast. So setting up habits is generally adaptive. And the way our brains set those up is that they will, will do a behavior and it'll kind of set up a reward value for that behavior. And then it'll forget about it. I think of it as set and forget. So as an example, when we, as a kid, you know, going to birthday parties, we start to associate the value of cake and we, we glom on a bunch of things. There's this composite reward value. That's not only the taste of the sugar and the fat, but also the friends, the parties, the presents, all those things. And the more parties we go to, the more that reward value gets solidified. Another example would be smoking cigarettes as a teenager, you know, learning to be cool at school or rebel against our parents or whatever. So we lay these things down. And then every time we see cake, our brain says, oh, I know how rewarding that is. Eat it. Or when we have a craving for a cigarette, our brain, you know, doesn't say, oh, you really want to do that? It just says, hey, smoke the cigarette, you know. So Later in life, that reward hierarchy has been set up, even though it's uh, based often on things that might have might have been help, helpful or just part of life, you know, like learning to eat cake as a kid. That's fine. <laughs> you know, uh, We could eat cake for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Probably didn't notice any difference. But, you know, certainly I can't do that now. Uh, I get the sugar rush and crash and it's, it wouldn't be good for my health. 
So these, these reward hierarchies get set up in our brain. And the only way to change them is through a simple ingredient, which is awareness. Okay. So the way that works is there, again, it's always two researchers that things are named after. So there were two researchers after which this model was developed. It's called the Rescorla Wagner uh, reward valuation. And basically it means that that set value is going to always stay the same unless something says, hey, this isn't rewarding anymore. So when we bring awareness to the behavior, we can either get a positive prediction error or a negative prediction error. And what that means, let's use the cake example. If I see the chocolate cake and I think, oh yeah, it's gonna, that, that looks good. And then I eat it and then I go, oh my goodness, this is the best cake I've ever had. Wow. My brain just had a positive prediction error where it was expecting it to be this rewarding, but it's actually more rewarding, okay? So it updates that reward value, or at least, you know, let's say it's from a certain bakery. For that bakery, my brain's going to say, that's the best chocolate cake in the world. I'm going to go back there for chocolate cake, okay? Updates the reward value in a, in a more rewarding way. When we pay attention to behaviors that aren't that helpful, like overeating or smoking or even worrying, we can get a negative prediction error simply by bringing awareness to that. And in fact, my lab's done research where we can build in a tool to help people pay attention as they overeat into our Eat Right Now app. We, we built this right in so that we could study it and we could actually watch that reward value decrease over time uh, to the point where it's below the value of not eating, of not overeating, for example. And it only takes about 10 or 15 times of people really paying attention very carefully to their behavior to see that that reward value is is not there. So that negative prediction error kicks in and then sticks after they've done it a couple of times, a couple being you know 10 or 15. For some habits, it can be a little bit longer, but the when we've looked at eating, when we've looked at smoking, it's roughly in that category. So it doesn't take a lot to update the reward value, but it does require awareness. That's the critical piece. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And when you bring that awareness to that situation, we can use the cake example. How long would you have to go about doing that? Like, would you quickly just have to go there and spend 15, 30 seconds? Or is it more of a involved process when we take the time to do that work? It's it, so it depends on the person, but I think it can, we have people pay attention as they're eating and then really pay attention to the results, right? Because it's the behavior result relationship that drives future behavior. So we have them pay attention right afterwards. And especially with eating, I have people go back and check in a couple of minutes later and then maybe a, an hour later because there can be even some delayed effects, which are hard to observe and then hard to then associate with like, oh, yeah, I overate and now I feel crappy. So have people pay attention during the process or right after the process, which can be relatively short depending on how much they're eating. And then also just drop into their embodied experience a couple minutes later, an hour later to check in again and ask themselves, you know, what am I getting from this? That's the basic, you know, the gist of the question is like, what am I getting from this? And I mean this not from an intellectual perspective, but truly embodied awareness. Like, what am I getting from this? And the critical reason for that is our thinking brains don't hold a candle to our feeling bodies. Our feeling bodies really are what drive not only perpetuation of habits, but also letting go of things. That's where the negative prediction error comes in. And I can see how using the cake example, that's a really tangible thing and, and easy enough to understand. But let's let's use the example of anxiety and, and that being, you know, something that's going on in our head versus something we're consuming. How would somebody go about using this process to to work with that? Yes. The way we're we have people do that and we're actually just pilot testing a new tool that we're going to put into our Unwinding Anxiety app that we're calling the Worry Tool. And the way that that works is that we have people drop into, you know, when they're worrying, drop into the experience and basically check in with themselves to see, you know, how long have I been worrying about this? Is this worrying actually solving the problem that is at hand? You know, is it helping me? actually get my task done? Is it helping me, you know, keep my kids safe, whatever. And then we have people drop in their direct experience and ask them, what's it feel like to be worrying? Basically, how rewarding is this? So anybody can do that where they can, you know, when they're worrying, they can ask themselves, well, 
what's it feel like to worry versus what's it feel like to plan for the future? Because that's ultimately that hijacking of our brain thinking and planning was there and then it became worries, typically how it rolls, where we you know, were trying to plan something out or think of all the scenarios that could happen and then we start freaking out about them. So as people drop into their direct experience, they can really pay attention and see what they're getting from worrying. The, probably the most uniform answer I get from that is people say, I feel more worried or more anxious. And so it just feeds right back into that anxiety, which then feeds into more worry, which then sends them over that event horizon into the black hole of anxiety. And because this is a thinking pattern that so many people do fall into, the anxiety and, and getting caught up in that, what like evolutionary purpose does it serve? Why do so many of us get there and get stuck in that if it's not really serving us? That is a great question to which I don't have a you know good scientific answer. I have not found anything in the scientific literature or even anything that makes sense that would suggest that, that anxiety is evolutionarily adaptive. My sense is that it was this arousal thing you know, that says, go get information that prompts us to, to do that, that kind of got sidetracked, that became more self-referential. So more recently in evolutionary history, we developed this self-referential you know, process where we can think about us doing things. You know, it's, oh, I did that. And I think it might get tied up there where we're getting caught up in the, in the situation rather than focusing on what needs to happen, which is just the thinking and planning. And in fact, you know, there's this network of brain regions that's literally called the default mode network, and it's very self-referential. It's called the default net mode network because that's what we tend to default to <laughs> when we're not doing anything else. So this is very pervasive where we are perseverating, and it tends to be that perseveration, just meaning thinking over and over and over, that tends to be in two, come in two flavors, either regretting the past, which goes on the side of things like depression, and then worrying about the future, which, which perpetuates anxiety. And both rumination and depression and, and worry about the future activate this default mode network. I see. And for somebody who's been caught up in this way of thinking, whether it be depression, anxiety, and, and you know it's not serving them, and they start to use some of these tools and crawl out of the hole and start to feel better, talk about what you see with patients when they start to think differently, because if they've been thinking this way for such a long period of time and have these grooves and, and patterns, it must feel weird to them not to be stuck in that, that ugly way of thinking. So how do you help navigate people who are going to start thinking differently, more positively when this is, this is all new to them? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. So the first step, and I'm thinking back to a woman in our Eat Right Now program who was so identified with overeating, she literally said to me, she said, I don't know who I am anymore because she had stepped out of it and she was in foreign territory. This is similar to the patient that I mentioned who was you know very overweight and started working with his anxiety and his overeating, who had been, I think he had started getting anxious around the age of eight or 10, somewhere in his first decade of life. And he was now 40. So this is 30 years he'd been doing this. He started being able to step out of these anxiety habit loops to the point where he was feeling moments of prolonged, you know, periods of joy and peace. And I remember at one visit him coming in saying, you know, Doc, is there something wrong? This feels so weird. Uh, you know, when I'm not anxious, I start to get anxious that there's something wrong, that I should be anxious. And so he was so identified with being anxious that to not be anxious felt strange. And so we started working with him to see how he could just identify, oh, this is a different place. Uncertainty doesn't mean danger. Right. And he started to recognize, oh, I'm not in danger. This is just a, I'm in my growth. So he can move into his growth zone, basically. And from there, he could try on those new clothes, let's say, of calm and peace rather than, you know, and let go of the old worn out clothes of anxiety. And then once that started to fit a little bit more, you know, he got used to what it felt like, then he could walk around in, in that new set of clothing, so to speak, his mental clothing. I see. 
And I think it was early on in the interview, you mentioned drug treatment for anxiety. The success rate was only about one in five. What is the gold standard right now if somebody comes in with anxiety and a classical approach? Is, is psychotherapy and, and a drug prescription kind of the gold standard? And, and if so, what, what drugs are clinicians using? Those are the gold standard, yes. So both medications and psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy in particular is the, is the recommended gold standard right now. So if you look at medications, the history of the medications is interesting because back in the 60s and 70s, the benzodiazepines were used very regularly, actually even later than that, you know, 80s, 90s. It's only now that we're starting to recognize, you know, that it, they're probably not that helpful. And if you look at the United Kingdom guidelines, they're nice criteria, whatever, National Institute for Care and Excellence or whatever. They, they don't recommend benzodiazepines as a first-line treatment for anxiety because of their addictive potential. They're, you know, they're short-term. People can become habituated to them. There possibly could be cognitive effects. So the Rolling Stones even sang about benzodiazepines. Uh, it was just from one of their songs. Mother, mother needs something today to calm her down, and though she's not really ill, there's a little yellow pill. She goes running for the shelter of a mother's little helper. <laughs> she goes running to the shelter of a mother's little helper. You know, that's what it's about. We want to feel good now and <laughs> benzos are pretty good at that. So, you know, benzodiazepines come in the flavors of like pro, uh, Xanax, uh, Valium, Ativan, Clonopin. Those are the brand names for, for a lot of those medications, you know. Um, the So those aren't recommended anymore, but the gold standard treatment tends to be in the class of antidepressants, actually, that were shown to have some modest effect for anxiety. These tend to come in, you know, the names of Prozac or uh, Zoloft or you know, uh, sertraline is the generic name for it, um, you know, citalopram, things like that. So these are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that seem to have you know, some effect, but not you know, it's again, it's the number needed to treat is 5.15. And then there are other older anti, uh, antidepressants like these tricyclics that have similar effects. So that's, that's what's, you know, gold standard even today for anxiety. And again, coming back to that stat, one in five being helped by the medication. In that case, are we talking about antidepressants? Yes, that's the gold standard class of medications that we're talking about there. Got it. So let's move on to number three, gear number three here. And so we've done the work in number one, number two, moving into number three, how do we, how do we finesse this into the whole mix? So this goes back to this reward valuation that our brains have. So the first you know, step is mapping out these habit loops. The second step is seeing how unrewarding the old habit is, whether it's worry or procrastination or stress eating or whatever. And then when our brain starts to see, okay, that's not really that rewarding, give me something better. That's what our brain's going to say. You know, it's like, what's better? So I think of it as the BBO, the bigger, better offer. So we can offer our brain something better, yet what we offer it makes a big difference. So if we're anxious and we start stress eating, you know, what they call it, the quarantine 15, where people are gaining weight, you know, during the quarantine, certainly a lot of uh, increase in alcohol use during the quarantine. And I saw this before the quarantine where a lot of my patients would drink as a way to um, moderate their anxiety or to try to distract themselves from it, basically feel better. So there can be these bigger, better offers that aren't that much better because they have their own consequences. You know, I had a patient, I wrote about him a little bit in my book where he would, he was up to drinking six to eight you know, shots of alcohol every night to to work with his anxiety and not very helpful for him. He was referred to me for alcohol use disorder. So, you know, whether it's going to Netflix and binging or scrolling on social media or whatever our distraction du jour is, that can be a bigger, better offer, but they tend to be, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that can be a bigger, better offer, but those tend to be problematic in the sense that they our brains habituate to them. So for example, you need to drink more alcohol over time to get the same effects. And they also can cause negative consequences like you know, killing our livers if we're drinking or whatever. So ideally, we want to find a bigger, better offer that is always available and doesn't become habituated. And here, 
awareness might actually be that bigger, better offer in itself. So we talked about awareness in first gear, you have to become aware of a habit loop. We talked about awareness in second gear, where you have to become aware of how unhelpful or unrewarding the old behavior is. Awareness itself, and in particular, that attitude of curiosity may be that bigger, better offer that because it comes from within, doesn't become habituated. So let me ask you a question, pop quiz hotshot, right? So this is not pre-rehearsed. Uh, if you were, if you had to pick between feeling anxious or being curious, which one feels better? Curious. Yeah. Yeah. It's a no brainer. So we can actually bring curiosity in when we're anxious and it starts to flip the valence from being caught up in that anxiety to being totally curious about what this feels like in our bodies. I'm not saying this is, you know, it's going to be a flip of the switch and suddenly we're always going to be curious, but that's something that we can work into over time. We can practice awakening because we all have this capacity to be curious. It's just often dusty or rusty, <laughs> you know, because we haven't used it very much. Well, since most of us haven't used this very much, let's get into the finer details. Talk about what that, what that looks like. So there are two flavors of curiosity. One is called deprivation curiosity and one is called interest curiosity. Deprivation curiosity is about that information seeking mode where we don't have the information, we don't know something. So it, that urges us to go look it up. You know, in the modern day, this gets habituated because we have these, you know, we have, we're always connected to the internet. So we can always look something up, you know, and it's kind of annoying when you're out to dinner with somebody and they say, who is that guy? And then they pull out their phone when it doesn't really matter who that movie star was, you know, and it, it breaks the flow of the conversation. So we can see how deprivation curiosity can help us get information, but it's also a double-edged sword. It can, it can lead us into down all sorts of rabbit holes and it in itself, because it's that, that edgy, urgy feeling doesn't actually feel that great. Okay. So it's important pe for people to know that and know that that's natural and normal and that we all you know, have deprivation curiosity. The curiosity I'm talking about specifically when it comes to working with old habits is the other type. It's called interest curiosity. You can think of deprivation curiosity as kind of a journey when you get to the destination. So deprivation being the destination. When you get to that destination, the curiosity is satisfied and then you move on with your day. Okay. Think of interest curiosity as the journey, the joy of discovery. So it doesn't matter where you're going. You're just totally interested and fascinated. And what, what happens, you know, if you look at a kid, like three-year-olds are great, are great at modeling this, where they're just, you know, if they're outside staring at nature, they're, they're, they're just walking around in wide-eyed wonder. You know, and that wide eye actually has an evolutionary origin. It's bringing in more information. So we have our eyes wide open. Oh, wow. What's this? What's this? What's this? That's interest curiosity. That's the joy of discovery. And literally, it feels great to be discovering things. So we can use, we can pair these two types of curiosity together. The deprivation curiosity can help us map out habit loops. Oh, what is this that's driving this, right? Let me find that out. But then we immediately pair that with the interest curiosity where we're truly exploring, not jumping to conclusions to try to you know, get the answer right away, but really asking ourselves, huh, what is driving this? And we can truly ask ourselves when we're anxious, huh, what does this feel like? So often because anxiety is unpleasant, you know, we're set up evolutionarily speaking, to run away from things that are unpleasant, to make them go away. You put your hand on a hot stove, you're going to pull it away because it's, it hurts. Anxiety hurts. And so our natural reaction is to make it go away as quickly as possible, which is why we distract ourselves or drink or smoke or whatever. Here, we have to learn to lean into the discomfort. And this is where curiosity can help us do that. We can get curious instead of going, oh, I'm anxious, you know, make this go away. You can go, oh. Here's anxiety. Here's this feeling in my body. Huh. What thoughts are happening right now? What emotions are coming up? Where do I feel this in my body? And we can even, I like this simple question, and we've actually embedded this as a, as a stress tool on our Unwinding Anxiety app, where I have people, when they're feeling anxiety, I ask them to drop into their body and ask themselves, where do I feel this most? Is it more on the right side or the left side of my body? Which gets us to go, huh, I don't know. 
in this moment, where is it more on the right side or the left side? The answer doesn't matter. It's not like left-sided anxiety is worse than you know, right-sided for a prognostic from a prognostic perspective. It's really about dropping us into that interest curiosity. So we start to explore what's actually happening. And the exploration itself already helps us unwind it. And the way it does that is through the, what's called an observer effect. This was first coined in physics, where they when they were measuring light, I think they were looking at these slit lamp experiments and found that when they were using a light detector, that detector actually affected the results of their experiments. So by observing, you're going to actually affect the results. You're going to affect the part, the light itself. We can do the same thing in psychology. So if we have a thought or an emotion and we're identified with it, you know, anxiety, I am anxiety, by observing it, huh, what does this feel like? We're creating that observer effect where there's perspective, there's distance, where we can't be as identified by definition because we are now observing it rather than rather being caught up in it. The challenge I have, I guess, with this is the fact that we're using the term bigger, better offer. And at least from the outside, somebody who hasn't done a lot of work in this, it seems like the bigger, better offer would be to turn on Netflix and to binge watch this, you know, multi-million dollar production that's been designed to stimulate us and engage us and and versus, okay, I'm feeling anxious. I'm going to go inside and see where I'm feeling some tingling and some different emotions. How could doing that inner work, that curiosity, how could that be the bigger, better offer? Yeah. So let me ask you, let's say that you're in the middle of a podcast interview, hypothetically speaking, and you start to get anxious, which I'm sure you never do. Can you say, oh, you know, can we pause this for a moment? Because I'm going to go binge on Netflix for the next day and then we'll come back to this. So just don't forget the flow of the conversation and we'll pick right up tomorrow. How well does that work? <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> so how about if you started to notice that you're getting anxious and then you just took a moment, hmm. And you just checked in with your body to feel, you know, just for a moment or two, oh, there's tightness, there's tension. Would that be a little more adaptive? A little easier to implement, yes, on the go. <laughs> I'm not saying that people can implement it like, at the, you know, without a little bit of practice, but ultimately, if somebody wants to binge on Netflix or do these other things, I would say go for it and see what you get from it. This is where they can actually drop into second gear and see if that's becoming a, a habit strategy. And they can ask themselves, is this helping me or not? This doesn't mean that watching Netflix is a bad thing. It's just, you know, at, at times when we're in the middle of work or whatever, we need other coping strategies that can actually help us uproot this at its core. And I don't mean that as in we'll never have anxiety again, but what we can do is fundamentally change our relationship to our thoughts, emotions, and feelings. If we can fundamentally change our relationship and see them as thoughts, emotions, and body sensations rather than who we are or be caught up in them, we can work with these things at any time when we're driving the car, when we're in a speech, when we're you know, doing a podcast and freaking out that we're not doing a good job. It can help us at any of those moments rather than just relying on these other things that not only can cause negative outcomes, right? You know, sitting on your butt watching Netflix is not that healthy if you do that a lot. And these things also become habituated. You know, I would, I'm sure somebody's got the record for watching, you know, X number of hours of Netflix at once, but I would have to say after that week or however long they've done it, I'm going to guess they don't feel very healthy. <laughs> you got to look more bigger picture. Yeah, definitely. It's about ultimate health, right? <laughs> definitely. And I guess an overarching theme here, I think it's important to highlight for people is that just understanding that our thoughts, our feelings, that they aren't us. I think that's just such a fundamental piece, such a basic piece that we could just gloss over. But for people that haven't made that connection yet, I think that's just so important for maintaining good mental health. Amen, brother. Absolutely. <laughs> so we've covered the curiosity piece in gear three. What else, what else do we have here? Well, I would say we can expand a little bit on the gear three a little bit, uh, you know, a bit more. So you can think of gear three as anything that helps us step out of a habit loop, whether it's worry or procrastination or, you know, stress eating or whatever. And here, what I would say is we can look at the fundamental aspect of what it feels like to be anxious, let's say. Let me ask you, does when you're anxious or hypothetically speaking, but because I'm sure you're never anxious. 
if if you were to get anxious, does it feel more closed down and contracted or more opened up and expanded? Contracted. Yeah. And when you feel that, um, well, contrast that now to times when you're curious. Does that feel closed or open? Very open. Okay. So we can touch on that aspect of experience, closed versus open. My lab's actually done studies on this where we've uh, surveyed hundreds of people and found that uniformly people report just like you did, anxiety feels closed, curiosity feels open. There are other mental states that also feel open. And the open states uniformly feel more rewarding than the closed ones. So if we can become aware of being in closed states and see what's leading to them, like if I'm worrying, I'm feeling more closed, that helps us become disenchanted with them. That's, that's gear two. We can then ask, well, what helps me feel more open? Curiosity is my go-to. <laughs> But if we are judging ourselves, so I see a lot of folks falling into self-judgmental habit loops for being anxious in it, you know, like, why am I anxious? You know, they beat themselves up. That self-judgment feels closed. Here they can bring in a specific antidote, which is kindness toward themselves, self-kindness. So when we're kind to ourselves or when kind to others or others are kind to us, you tell me, does kindness feel closed or open? It's a really unique, open feeling. Yeah, yeah. So we can tap into anything that helps us feel open and we can see what strategy to employ in a mo in any moment based on what the cause is. So if I'm just judging myself, self-kindness is the natural antidote. If I'm just getting stuck in feelings of anxiety, curiosity is the natural go-to strategy there. We can also bring in things that can help us form or just come, become more habitually open, you know, that we can lean into that more. So for example, gratitude practice. There's a lot of research around people just, you know, taking moments at the end of the day to be grateful for what they have. And I mean, I'll stop asking, stop quizzing you, but gratitude feels open too, right? So I think of kindness and curiosity. Those are two big categories into which other things fit. So, you know, I would put gratitude in the category of kindness where we're, we're grateful for all the things, you know, that have, that we've, that have been bestowed on us or however we want to think of gratitude. And with curiosity, you know, that, that the journey of exploration of life of being open-minded is really uh, opening. And also we can apply this in, you know, in moments where you, we can look at being divisive or arguing with somebody and trying to hold on to a fixed view or like, I'm right, you're wrong. That causes suffering. What if we move into a curious stance where we are trying to really put ourselves in their shoes and understand where they're coming from? Well, even if it doesn't, you know, and, and we don't have an agenda, like by the end of this argument, you have to, you have to see things my way. You know, there's a fixed view. We can move into growth mindset for all of these things where we can and live our lives in, in growth mindset because literally it feels open. So here I would say we can extend third gear to encompass anything that really helps us feel open rather than something that just drive old, drives old habits. You know, for example, we, we drink alcohol. Maybe if we're totally blitzed, we might feel open or we might think that we feel open, but that can actually lead to craving, which it feels closed and then just drives that cycle more. So that's, that's where I would encourage folks to really explore what are the things that, that help sustainably lead us into open states and then rinse and repeat. That makes sense. And Judd, we've gone over quite a bit with the three gears. Can you kind of do a summary, bringing all three together, just so people can have a, a general overview of what this looks like? I'd be happy to. So you can think of the main ingredient for all of these is awareness and a curious awareness where we're really open to what's happening. Uh, first gear, mapping out a habit loop, trigger behavior result or reward. So just mapping out whatever the, the habit loop is, whether it's related to anxiety worry, procrastination, stress eating, whatever. Okay, that's first gear. Second gear is really just asking this fundamental question, what am I getting from this? Which helps our brain update the reward value. If something is not serving us, we can see that clearly and that reward value drops. If something is serving us, we can do it more. So for example, kindness. Oh, when I'm kind, map out a kindness habit loop. Oh, when I'm kind, I feel good. Oh, maybe I want to do that more. It gets a positive prediction error there. So that's, that's second gear is 
you know, really looking at the reward value through this simple question of what am I getting from this and really dropping into our direct experience to, to answer that, not from a cognitive perspective. Third gear is the bigger, better offer. So finding those bigger, better offers that help us step out of old habit loops that are not healthy or helpful and into ones that are. So, you know, two flavors, kindness, curiosity, and many derivations of those. But really, it's about helping us see what are what things help us open to our experience versus are closed down. And kindness and curiosity tend to be the the epitome of of those things. So that those are the three gears. Yeah. Thanks for summarizing that. That's great. And inherently within curiosity, we're being mindful. We're we're scanning in our body and and seeing the sensations, looking at the thoughts. But that's that's kind of like meditation in practice. Well, our, that's meditation within day-to-day life. And I like how you explain this in the book, and I'm trying to get to this, where mindfulness is kind of like the overarching umbrella. Meditation is a tool within that. Yes. So when we're using curiosity, we're we're being mindful, we're, we're exercising that muscle. But then when would somebody want to use that specific tool within mindfulness, meditation, to help accentuate, you know how our brains work and and being more mindful in general. So here I would say, you know, formal meditation practices where we're doing a prolonged period, not just a moment of mindfulness, can really help us see these patterns more clearly where we might not where where we might just be touching the surface. So as we do, you know, the classic example is a seated meditation and we're sitting there just observing our thoughts, observing our habit patterns. We can see which habit patterns happen a lot. We can see what the results are pretty clearly. You know, if I start worrying, I can feel right into that direct experience without any distractions around me. So I can really get a very, very clear sense of what that feels like. And so I would say here, this really kind of decreases the noise, the everyday noise that might be there when we're observing in everyday life to help us notice the very subtle aspects that can be driving these behaviors that we might not be able to notice otherwise. I remember being on, a, I think it was a month long silent meditation retreat and just mapping out these things for myself and seeing that, you know, pleasant experiences led to craving and unpleasant experiences led to craving. And I had this aha moment where I was thinking, wow, you know, all these things drive craving and the craving itself doesn't feel very good. And I remember going up to the retreat teacher at the time saying, you know, blah, blah, blah. and, they're, and they're, <laughs> dude, they gave me this look like, okay, you finally saw it, <laughs> you know, so so it can be subtle and these things that are right in front of our faces might be hard to observe without the you know the you can think of it as the isolation where where we're removing all these other distractions. Okay. And you've come up with quite the model here, very impressive and and totally fascinating. I'm glad we really got to dig into it and and probe at it and see how it all works. But I'm curious because you're a scientist, you're somebody in the lab who is constantly researching Where's the next area of research for you? What are you trying to poke and prod at in your lab that you might be able to eventually bring into this this model? So here we're doing two things. So my lab is a translational neuroscience lab. So we develop apps and study them clinically. And we also look at the fundamental neurobiology of how these things work mechanistically in the brain. What I like to do that is this real translational work, you know, they call it bench to bedside, where not only are we learning from these, you know, neuroscientific principles that we that we see, like these neural mechanisms, we can use those to inform treatment. So what we're starting to do now is look to see if we can identify what we're calling psychological phenotypes, where at baseline, somebody might have a certain phenotype where they, um, you know, they're, they're either worried and they don't know it, you know, um, or you know, what's that song? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. So if, if you're worried and you know it, clap your hands, because those folks, uh, we're, we have some preliminary data suggesting that people that are aware of their worry are actually, they do better in, in certain mindfulness training programs. So we can actually uh, think of this as starting to personalize medicine, where we can 
take a baseline phenotype just with the use of a questionnaire. We don't even need neuroimaging for this, although we've done some neuroimaging studies that have suggested we can also identify you know, responders versus non-responders to treatment. But we can have these simple, uh, low-cost tools to identify phenotypes and then personalize a training based on that phenotype. So, okay, you're this, you're category A, you do this, you know, this type of training, your category B, you know, you do this. And what we're largely doing is looking at this in, re in relation to, you know, mindfulness training for anxiety, our unwinding anxiety app, where we can identify there are two thirds of people that do extremely well. And then there's a third of folks that don't do as well. And we're starting to phenotype them to see what it is that makes them struggle more with the program so that we can augment their training so that they do as well as everybody else. Because I would love, you know, even though we've got this number needed to treat of 1.6, I would love to get that even lower. And I think we can do that through personalizing these trainings. And I think that's really the next frontier in all of digital therapeutics, you know, these, this next wave of delivering treatments right at people's fingertips, literally. Very cool. And Dr. Judd, not in a clinical sense, but in a day-to-day -day sense, when it comes to anxiety, would you say anybody makes it through life unscathed? And again, we're not talking about clinical yeah, need yeah, to, yeah. you know, go see a psychologist or psychiatrist and, and be medicated, but like, isn't it a normal part of being human, anxiety? Yes, I am yet to meet that person that has never gotten anxious or stressed or frustrated by anything. <laughs> if you're out there, contact me. We'd love to study you in our lab. <laughs> well, I think it's important that we talk about this because we're normalizing the human experience where people that, you know, are having these, and again, you've had a series of panic attacks in your life and, and you know, you're, you're somebody who's, you know, as far as I know, you're, you're, you're doing well and you're, you're overall have good mental health. But I think it's important that we talk about like these things that do happen, suffering from anxiety in this case is a normal part of the human experience. Absolutely. Just yesterday, <laughs> I was out surfing and got caught inside a set where these waves are just pounding on me. And I had to work with my anxiety and not panic because if I panic when I'm getting held underwater, that's a problem. <laughs> you know? So it's, it, you know, that's my practice edge. And I think, you know, so there is a common condition now that I think about it uh, that we all have. I, I, we can think of it as the, uh, the human condition. <laughs> and as part of that human condition, we all have these things happen. It's a key it, the key piece is seeing, oh yeah, this is normal. And also seeing, oh, if I know how my mind works, it makes it much easier to work with it. And so I'm constantly learning. And I think we all can be on that journey of discovery where we're constantly learning and constantly working with whatever comes up. I'm glad we came back uh, full circle on the story that you alluded to in the beginning of our conversation about the surfing. Take us through a little bit more of the detail on how your mental processing, you know, took you through that experience. Yeah. So uh, I can, I remember this pretty, pretty vividly, you know, I was on a, I was trying to push my edge and, you know, surf a wave that was a little bigger than I was used to. And it had this very steep drop. It's actually, uh, it has a name called acid drop and there's a reason for that. <laughs> and so I would, I kept biffing, you know, and, and not catching it. And, you know, I would, in those moments where I was being held underwater and, you know, just feeling, you know, getting, what do they call it? Um, washing machined. I had to notice my thoughts in those moments, really notice those thoughts. And I, rem I remember just saying, okay, you know, you've got air in your lungs. <laughs> you've got plenty of air in your lungs. You will come up <laughs> and panic isn't going to help here. I remember telling myself panic isn't going to help here. So I could see the thoughts and I could be on the lookout for when those thoughts were you know, moving into the wildly unthinking behavior category, which would be flailing and trying, you know, using up all my oxygen to, to do something that wasn't going to help me. And then after that, you know, after it took me a little while to really just have that physiologic arousal just kind of wash out of me because it was, you know, it was, it was there for a little while, but it took a couple of extra uh, of other waves that I was, you know, was able to catch and whatnot. And then to be able to sit between the sets 
and just check in, be like, oh, how am I feeling now? How am I feeling now? And then also noticing when I'd see a wave start to form that was bigger to see if it was fear that was coming up or could I actually bring in the joy of, oh, can I catch this one? And that's what I was mo- leaning into. It's like, oh, can I can I remind myself why I'm trying to surf in the first place, which is this can be really fun. Uh, you know, this isn't about just testing my limits or seeing if I can't drown. <laughs> this is about the joy of surfing. And by the end of the day, it was it was a great session. Uh, but it was a it was a huge progression from like I'm gonna give up surfing altogether. This is terrible. To wow, that was that was really fun. Well, it's interesting you bring up giving up surfing. How important is it with these situations when we have hiccups like your surfing incident that we get back on the board metaphorically and get back in there instead of walling that off and then, you know, allowing the uncertainty and the fear to keep us from doing that activity that we want to do? Like, how important is it to get back on the horse? Well, I think it's critical. And one one aspect that we need to be checking is like, is this just stupid? So I'm not going to surf crazy big waves ever. <laughs> I don't need to do that. I'm, I, you know, I've been surfing long. I have not been surfing long enough to ever be that good, you know, leave it to the pros. So one thing is to make sure like, am I just constantly putting myself in a situation of danger? And is that not a good idea? Right. So being able to differentiate that from, okay, that was, I'm, I'm in out of my comfort zone. And can I be in my growth zone? I think of it as essential, not only if there's something that we really want to learn and get better at, like for me, it's surfing, but also that extends beyond both of these. You know, if we take one path or the other, they both extend to the rest of our lives. So if we're constantly saying, oh, that's uncomfortable, I'm going to wall that off and I'm not going to do it. It's like potholes forming in the street and saying, I'm just going to drive around them as compared to filling the potholes. Eventually, our street gets so pothole lined that we can't drive it. And that's what life is like. You know, our life is so pothole lined that we're not living it. Whereas if we go and we pave those over by getting back on the horse, it's like, oh, there's another pothole. And we know even we we get even better at filling those holes quickly so that we can keep learning from them. And eventually like, woo, pothole. Wow, that was crazy. What can I learn from that? (laughs) I like that analogy. Dad, I know you got to go, you got to go teach, but uh, other than listeners getting a copy of Unwinding Anxiety, how can they connect with you after the show? Well, I'm on Twitter at Judd Brewer, J-U-D-B-R-E-W-E-R. And also I've got a bunch of free resources on my website. I, I just love trying to get the scientific information out to the public. So my website's drjud, drjud.com. We've got a bunch of you know, things that folks can check out if they want to dive more deeply into things like everyday addictions and, you know, reward value. We, we put together some nice animations about those things. And I would encourage folks to take a look. There's a one of my favorite short animations we just put together was on kindness spreading virally. And the idea is, you know, fear can spread through the internet. Can we actually spread kindness through social contagion? That's how I want to live the, in my life. And that's how I would love all of us to catch that virus of being kind and connected with each other. So if anybody checks out my website, please check out that. I think it's something about the the power of kindness, uh, short short animation. I'll have to check it out. We're going to link it all up in the show notes. And Judd, before we part ways, any final thoughts you want to leave the listeners and viewers with? Stay kind and curious. All right. I really enjoyed this conversation. And thank you, Judd. Thank you.